So, where do you find yourself today? There came a time when three young Hebrew men were thrown into a fiery furnace, and it was because they would not bow at the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had made. When Nebuchadnezzar told them what their fate was going to be, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us and from that burning, fiery furnace. And if not, he will deliver us from your hand, O King Nebuchadnezzar. But if not, let it be known to you, O King, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Daniel 3 tells us that Nebuchadnezzar commanded that the furnace be made seven times hotter than usual. It was so hot that the men who threw these three Hebrew young men into the fire were burned up themselves as they put him in. The king set himself up to watch. He was going to watch these three Hebrew kids be burned to a cinder. He was going to enjoy it because they had gone against his rule and his regulation. But he became extremely astonished because as he sat there, not only were they not burning up, they were walking around. And not only were they walking around, there was a fourth man walking with them. And he cried out to the, his servants and he said, did we not just put three men in there? And they said, yes, we did. And he said, well, if so, who is that fourth man I see walking around with them? There's no indication that the three Hebrew children saw the fourth man at all. It only indicates that King Nebuchadnezzar was the only one that saw the fourth man, who is Jesus Christ, in there with them. Nebuchadnezzar ordered them taken out of the fire, and they came out. And when they came out, they saw that these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. There was not one hair singed, nor were their garments affected, and there was absolutely no smell of smoke on them. Nebuchadnezzar then ordered that the God that these three men served would now be the God of the country, and that's who everybody in the country must serve from now on. And the young men got promoted in the kingdom. From the fiery furnace to all people serving God to promotion in the kingdom. That's our God. Time went on. The kingdom changed, and Darius became king. Daniel was one of three governors who were in charge over 120 men. But Daniel was of such an excellent spirit, he found favor in the king's sight. And the king was looking to put him over all the realm. And you know what happens when that kind of thing starts happening, when God starts granting favor to some of his people. There's always jealousy that will rise from somewhere. And so jealousy sprang up in the hearts of many of these people, and they were determined they were going to bring Daniel down. They looked for anything and everything, and they could find nothing to charge him with. So they decided they would try to get King Darius to issue a decree that anyone who prayed to any other god or any other man to ask them anything other than King Darius himself, they would have to be put into a lion of dens, a den of lions. <laughs> and back in those days when the king issued a decree, it stood strong regardless. There was nothing that could change that decree. Not even the king who wrote it could make any changes in it. It was exactly as it was written. But Daniel couldn't take that sitting down. Daniel not only prayed to the living God, God the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he had to open his windows to do it. And he prayed three times a day with open windows, and that earned him the trip to the den of lions. 
This time it was the king who was really sorry. Darius really, really had, had liked this young man. And he was determined to favor these, this young man. And yet the decree said he had to go to this uh, den of lions. And it, so he was so very sorry. And he was the one that spoke to Daniel. And he said, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. So the king was speaking words of faith and words into Daniel. That night it was the king who spent the sleepless night. Daniel used the lions, I'm sure, for pillows because they were as docile as they could be. And he could just go in there and rest in the midst of that storm, in the midst of those lions that were ferocious, and there was not one bit of harm. But the king couldn't sleep all night long. And he came to the uh, den early in the morning and he said, Daniel, has your God, the living God, saved you? Has he been able to save you? And Daniel was able to sound, give a resounding, yes, I'm fine, I'm all right. And the mouths of those lions were shut all night long. It's very interesting because when the king delivered him out of the den, he caused the people that had put him in the den, that had caused the trouble. He caused them, their wives and their children to all be thrown in the lion's den and were told that the lions ate them all up. So it wasn't because the lions weren't being a lion. It, they just didn't harm God's man and God's choice. So this Daniel prospered not only during the reign of Darius, but also with the reign of Cyprus, the Persian. At one time, Samaria was totally shut down. No food, no water, enemy all around, no help anywhere it seemed. And Elisha started prophesying in the middle of that city. And he said, tomorrow about this time, flour and barley will be so plentiful, it will be selling for very little. And one of the king's men close to him said, if the Lord could make windows in the heavens, how could such a thing be? And Elisha looked at that man and he said, you will see it, but you will not partake of it. There just happened to be four leprous men sitting outside that city. And they knew the problem inside the city. They knew the problem outside the city. They were not allowed to go into the city because of their disease. And as they sat there, they realized how desperate their situation was. If they stayed where they were, they were going to die. If they went into the city, they were going to die. And if they went to the enemy, there was a chance, maybe, they could live. But if they couldn't, what were they going to do? They were going to kill them, and they were going to die anyway. So it made sense to go try and go see what could happen. So the most unlikely people in all of this world started walking towards the enemy's camp to surrender. As they walked and they stumbled along at twilight, all at once the enemy heard the sound of horses and chariots unbeknownst to these four leprous men because they were just walking to turn themselves in. They walked into the camp to surrender, and when they got into the camp, the camp was totally empty. Those enemy people, those soldiers, had thought they were hearing an approaching army coming to destroy them, and they had run for their lives. They had run so quickly and so hard, they left their camp intact. They left their tents, they left their horses, their donkeys, they left everything they had in the tents. And when the leprous men got there, they found all the fortune there of the enemy for the plundering of it. These men couldn't keep it to themselves, so they went back to the city to share. We've got good tidings. We've got good news. We have found an abundance of things. In 24 hours, just as Elisha had prophesied to that city, 24 hours later, the, there was an overabundance of food, and it was selling in the streets as if it were nothing, just for pennies. 
the man who questioned whether the windows of heaven could be opened and could that even happen if that were true, he did not get to partake of it even as Elisha said. He was able to see it with his own eyes. But the people in running for this abundance all of a sudden of food in their midst trampled on him and he died. So he saw it, but he did not partake of it. Sometimes the most unexpected people in the most unexpected ways are able to bring blessing from God upon us abundantly exceeding abundantly above anything that we can think, ask, or pray. At one time, Elisha had prayed for a woman's son who had died, and he came back to life. And sometime later, Elisha went to the lady and he said, look, he said, there's going to be a famine here, and the famine's going to last seven years. It would be really good if you take you and your household and go to wherever you can for these seven years and then come back when the famine is over. During that time of famine, her land fell into the hands of others, and it seemingly she had lost everything that uh, was coming was supposed to be hers, that it seemed nothing was coming back. So it seemed. So Elisha's servant, after the famine, had gone to visit the king because the king kept asking, tell me about Elisha. Tell me the stories. What did he do? Tell me all about him. And Gehazi was standing in the king's office or palace and and he was telling the king all about this woman at that particular time, how her son had died and God had worked through Elisha and the son had lived again. And he heard a noise and he turned and he looked to the side and here came in this woman and her son. And Gehazi said, oh, here she is right now, her and her son. And the king questioned her more about it. And this woman made her appeal to the king. King, can I just get my land and my house back now? And when the king uh, heard her story and her appeal, God gave her favor. And he said, you can not only have everything that belonged to you, but every bit of profit that's been made off that land in these last seven years will come to you. And all at once, She's got everything back and even more than she expected. So I ask you again today the question, where do you find yourself today? Do you find yourself in the fiery furnace? I'm telling you, you can be in the fiery furnace and it can seem so hot that it will kill other people around you. But there's a fourth man in your fiery furnace, and that fourth man, Jesus Christ, is walking with you. I'm telling you today, you can come out of your fiery furnace. You can come out whole, not a scent of smoke on you, not a hair singed, not a bit of your clothing affected, but the fourth man walking in that fire with you keeps you in all your ways, and you come out just as if it hadn't happened. Does it seem like you're in a den of lions today? Everything around you is roaring, oh my. And it seems you will be eaten alive. Only you find out that the lions can't touch you. They can touch others, but they can't touch you. You're a child of the Most High, and God is keeping you. You will hear the noise, and you will see the possibilities of what could happen, but it doesn't happen to you. Does it seem like the whole city is shut down? There's no food, there's no water, there's no anything. It seems like all hope is gone. And then from the un most unlikely source, from the most unlikely place, God causes people to come into your life that turns the whole situation around. One day it is as bad as it can possibly get, and the next day it is so totally different, it's as if there had never, ever, ever been any lack or any problem? Does it seem like someone else has come in and has taken over your land and your house and everything you own? 
You seemingly came back to nothing, no land, no belongings, no anything. It's gone. But you walk into a place to talk to someone about your situation. You find favor with that person. And little do you know, little do you know that God has already caused someone else to be there talking. It seems like it's just a coincidence, and I believe we call many of God's happenings a coincidence. It just seems like, well, isn't that a coincidence? Wasn't that a coincidence that Je Gehazi just happened to be there talking about that woman? After seven years, he just happened to be there when she walked in. I want you to know there's God, God's on the throne and God's working on your behalf and God's even causing people to do things and be places and say things that relate to you and relate to what God's doing in your life and will be doing in your life. And, and, and it, it seems so natural. So many times we're experiencing the miracles of God that seem so natural that we could almost dismiss them. And we've got to be careful to make sure that God's getting the glory for everything. Even if we, uh, it appears it's just a coincidence, behind just the coincidence, God is working on our behalf. And you walk in, Someone else has been there. God has already caused paths and doors to open. And you walk in and you're granted favor. And everything you thought had lost, you had lost. Everything that you thought had been taken from you is now given back. And even stuff that you hadn't lost because all the profit since the other person had it comes back to you. We're in the day of miracles, and I'm telling you, if God has done it before, he can do it again. But let me tell you more than that. If God hasn't done it before, he can do it. He doesn't need to have done it before. I just want you to know, I have been, and I am, in some of these situations that I've just been talking to you about. But I've heard people say to me in times past, you know, I know some of the things you've been through, but there's no scent of smoke, and I give all glory to God. I've come through some stuff that uh, a lot of people maybe would have been eaten up with. A lot of people wouldn't have made it through the fire. But God gave me the grace. Jesus Christ helped me, and I've been able to come out, shake it off, and go on, and the enemy has not been able even to put the stench of smoke on me. I've seen people who would have tried to swallow me alive if they could have, and the very day they tried, God was already setting up ambushments that they were going to be left speechless. I've experienced it. I've seen days when there was no food in our house, and as I looked around, I found a little flour, a little milk, an egg, an apple, and some brown sugar. And as I prayed, God led me to a recipe, and it was apple pancakes. I made apple pancakes for my family that night, and that has become one of our fam family's favorite recipes. In fact, Daryl asked that for his birthday this year, and last Sunday on his birthday, we had apple pancakes. I've been in the place that it seemed it was all gone, and then God came. God answered and he did it in magnificent ways. It was ways I could have never thought of myself. And it was through people that I had no idea could even help me, even if I had told them about my situation. And I didn't even tell them. Someone else told them. It was like a Gehazi had gone before me and told someone the situation. And God used those people to bless me super abundantly. I want you to know today, our God is faithful. Our God is faithful. A lady from Texas prophesied to me many years ago and she said, I've just seen a vision of you and said, I see you walking through your house and I hear you saying, God is faithful. 
God is faithful. And she saw right. If there's anything I do, I look around my house. I look at what God's done for me. And I continually declare God is faithful. And God's faithfulness hasn't stopped. God's faithfulness continues on. Isaiah 65, 24 tells us, It shall come to pass that before you call, I will answer. And while you are still speaking, I will hear. God isn't far off. It may seem like the heavens are brass, but God is hearing. God is listening. God is answering. The answer's on the way. Matthew 28, 20, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. Jeremiah 33, verse 2 and 3, this is what the Lord says, the Lord who made the earth, who formed and established it, whose name is the Lord. Ask me, and I will tell you remarkable secrets you do not know about things to come. I think one of the things, my, one of my problems is getting stopped long enough to hear him tell me those wonderful secrets he has. Matthew 7, 7 through 11, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. To everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if we sinful people know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? A couple of months ago, I was at my daughter's house. Um, my air conditioning had gone out and uh, uh, various things were going on. And I was feeling really, really down that day. And I got up at my daughter's house that morning to come back to my house to check about the air conditioning, et cetera, et cetera. And as I got up, I realized a little earring was missing. And I don't know if you can even see that earring. It's so tiny, just a tiny little earring. And I could not find that earring anywhere. And I went out to get in my car. I had not parked on my daughter's grand, uh, driveway. I had par parked over on the grassy area on the ground so cars, other cars could come in and go out. And as I walked around my car that morning, I said, Lord, if my children had lost something that small, I would help them find it. And that's, I was feeling sorry for myself, truthfully. And I was reminding God what I would do for my earthly children. And I knew his promise to me was he would do even more than we earthly parents could do. And I no more than got those words out of my mouth. And I went around the corner and I looked on the ground and underneath a blade of grass, I saw a little something sparkling. And I thought, what if? And I reached down and there was this earring. If God cares that much <laughs> for a little inexpensive earring, but something that was important to me that day, how much more? Does God care about so many other things in your life and my life? I want to tell you this morning, and I want to assure you that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you are asking for.
that you are praying for, that you are dreaming about, our God is more than able. I encourage you today. You're coming out of the fire. The city is going to be full once more. Your belongings are going to be returned, and the lions aren't going to eat you up because we're in a new place in God, and God is moving by His Spirit. God bless you today. Thank you.